Microphony number one. For my work composition, for my work uh, Momenta, I found in Frankfurt during a fair of musical instruments a large tam tam. It is usually called a gong, but the right name is a tam tam. It has a diameter of about five feet, 155 centimeters, and it can produce sounds which last longer than a minute, if you hit it once. Sometimes you have seen in movies this monster, which is hit at the beginning, and then there is the throat of a lion that opens up. We have always this association of the lion's roar with this tam-tam. The tam-tam didn't come from China, but a family from East Prussia, a father and two sons, are making these tam-tams in a place in Switzerland and now in northern Germany. And the father has been in China and has learned the technique to make these instruments. The tam-tam was hanging in my garden. I couldn't put it in, into the living room. It was too large. And every once in a while, when I would walk out into the garden, I would take a pen or a key and scratch it or I would just knock it with a finger or take a little stone, bang it with a stone, um, write on it with a stone. And I remember that very often I was leaning my ear very close to the surface of the tam-tam and I heard all sorts of very strange sounds, vibrations, which already at a distance of four or five inches disappeared. One day, I told the technician who was always working with me in the studio to bring along a filter, an electric filter. We have such nice continuous filters that can be played like an instrument with one hand, having an upper and a lower knob that move either in parallel or in opposite direction. And what is in between these two knobs, what can be seen as numbers, is coming through when you feed a sound through the filter. Only what is between the two indicators comes through. Then. I told him to bring a so-called potentiometer, which is a device to control the loudness of sounds. And I had my own tape recorder in the living room. And then I took a basket, went into the kitchen, and gathered together all sorts of tools, spoons, glasses, pieces of rubber. I remember a plastic box that you use for measuring the time to cook eggs. Um, wooden pieces, wooden spoons, for example. In particular, several in small instruments that are made nowadays of plastic material. And with that basket, I walked to the Tam Tam. I took a microphone in my hand and I put the wire around my arm and then started taking one tool after another out of the bag of the basket and scratching, rubbing, uh, every once in a while also a little bit uh, hitting against the surface of the tam-tam. And at the same time I moved the microphone uh, most of the time 
unconsciously in which direction, but I, I tried all sorts of movements. I went away with the microphone like this, and then I came very close to where I was scratching, and then I moved into that direction, all directions. And what I was doing was recorded in the living room by the technician, <coughs> and he moved at random the filter. He could not hear what I was doing. It was about uh, 15, 15 yards, and then it was outside of the room, 15 yards away. So he played the filter completely at random, and also the potentiometer, and recorded this result. This we did for about 20 minutes, and then I walked in and said, let's hear that. And I must say what I heard as the result, what we both heard, was so astonishing that we both, both started uh, embracing each other and said, we have made a big discovery, great discovery. This is unbelievable. You heard all sorts of animals that I have never heard in real, and at the same time, many, many sounds which I couldn't imagine before, many, many sounds which we had never discovered during the work in the electronic music studio, where I was working already for more than 12 years when I made that experiment. And on the basis of this experiment, I composed a work which is called Microphony Number 1. Microphone is in the title, the microphone being used as an instrument and being played with, like with the bow of a violin. And phony, like in symphony, microphony. Uh, the number of musicians that I chose varied in the beginning of the composition, and finally I decided to take to work with two groups. And in each group, two or uh, three musicians. Let me briefly describe what the three musicians in one group are doing. One musician is, as I say, exciting the tam-tam. He uses all sorts of, of different tools that he gathers together. He naturally discusses with his friends what may be the best tool to produce a certain sound. And I will tell you later on what he is looking for when he tries to find a tool to produce sounds. The second player in his group uses the microphone throughout the performance and moves the microphone with prescribed movements. They are notated. And the third player of one group is sitting in the auditorium among the people who are listening and he uses the filter, the same type of filter that we used in the experiment, and a potentiometer, the device to control the loudness, and the output of his instruments is connected to loudspeakers which are in the hall. And all the people here is uh, primarily what is coming through the loudspeakers. Only sometimes one is able to hear the sound from the tam-tam itself, when the tam-tam is played very, very hard, very um, intensely. So the musicians must hear, and always hear, naturally, the sound that is coming through the speakers, as well as the people in the hall. So what they really hear is the result in each group of a chain work. The man who excites hardly can judge upon what he is doing, because this man here is doing something else and transforming already what he is doing. And this man is again doing something else and transforming what the two have, have been doing. So within each sound phenomenon, a sound event that comes through the speakers, 
there's a multiple interference of three musicians who work in a chain. And we never can say what the sounds really are, except, I mean, the sounds of the tam-tams are, except of, um, that we can say what we hear through the speaker. And there's something very characteristic in, not only in music, in our times, that all we can say in analyzing or, yes, analyzing something that is happening in the microcosm is that we describe the tools that we use to amplify something that we want to hear or to see, uh, that's going, what is going on in the microcosm. So we are more or less uh, getting what our instruments, our tools can provide. But there, there's a lot of mystery about the sounds, the waves themselves that are produced directly in the tam-tam. They are amplified, enormously amplified. They are filtered. In this case, the microphone is moved. So the original waves are constantly transformed. And all we know is what we get when we conduct a certain action. And this is what I call, in general, microphony. A microphonic process. The microphone is no longer a passive tool for high fidelity reproduction of something that we know, like a voice, but it becomes an active instrument. And it influences what it is recording. I have drawn on this board one section of the score, and this will immediately clarify what I'm saying. We're speaking at the moment about one group of players. Can you see this? The score for each group, this is for one group, is subdivided into three sections. One section, another section, a third section. The upper section is for the first player who plays on the surface of the tam-tam. The second section is for the microphone, who uses the microphone. And the third section is for the player who plays the filter and the potentiometers here. This is one player. Each section is subdivided into three areas. There is, in the case of the tam-tam player who plays on the surface, <coughs> a subdivision of high, middle, and low registers. When he produces a sound and I draw something in the upper area, then the sound is supposed to be high, must be high. Here it must be medi medium in register, middle, in the middle register, and here low. Then here we have three areas for the microphonist. When something is drawn into this area, the microphone should be very close to the point of excitement. If this were the tam-tam, and I'm scratching <coughs> here, then the microphone can be held by the other one, other player, right here, very close. The microphone can also be held here, or here, on the surface of the tam-tam. So there are three regions, which are relative, if you're scratching here, then very close, there or there. And this relative indication of very close, uh, middle distance away from the point of excitement, and the first is the way from the point of excitement on the surface of the tam-tam, is indicated in these three areas. For example, this stroke then, I will analyze a little bit further afterwards <coughs> the, the graphic instructions of this 
a sheet, but uh, you can see already when he starts here and goes to there, then he's very close and goes away from the point of excitement. Then uh, the, for the filter, we have actually a similar subdivision like in the a areas of the tam, tam player. This means high filtering, middle uh, registers and low registers. Actually, the filter that we use has nine sub-areas between 30 cycles per second and uh, 12,000 cycles per second. And these area, areas are more or less equidistant. So which means he can, here, within each area, still subdivide the area into three sub-areas. And this simply means that uh, when he starts playing, then the filter is open in this region. Then with the two knobs which I described, he moves right here. Then he remains for a while, and then he moves here again. Then he moves only this one, and then he leaves it for a while. Then he closes the filter. He, op he opens it again up to here. Then he closes both a little bit. Then he closes the lower one, the upper one. Uh, he opens the lower one, the upper one, the lower one, the upper one, the lower one, the upper one, etc. Now the whole score, what concerns time, is drawn in scale, like most of the scores, with uh, more precise indications for the tempo. Uh, here we have indications which indicate the number of unities of that particular musical moment. And we are beginning, it was a graphically a very good example, that's why I took it, I begin at the 47th unit, this is 49, 52, think for a moment seconds. Then the thickness of the lines, like in several other scores, indicate the following. For the turn player, player, the, the thickness of the lines definitely indicates the intensity uh, with which he is scratching, for example, or rubbing on the surface. There are three thicknesses which I use as relative indications for the dynamics. The thin line, or a medium line, like this one, or a thick, this could also be a line, but not just a point. Also points are come in three different thicknesses. So the thicker, the more intense you play. Then these three relative indications, one, two, and three, this is the second degree, this is the first, this is the third, dynamics. They are relative within a predominant dynamics, and this is written on top. This says medium loud. So medium loud is always the, the maximum in this section. This is medium loud, then this is uh, two degrees softer. Still medium loud, which means when he does this movement on the surface of the tantum, he starts uh, <coughs> soft and becomes uh, two degrees louder. This is the maximum of width of the strokes that I use, number three. And this means mezzo forte. So he does this movement means becoming louder and softer again. Same. Here it's the same related to piano. And then it says that there is a crescendo, which means an increase of dynamics during this section. And these here then are relative dynamics. Here it's the same. We have degree of uh, dynamic degree uh, three, two, one, two, three. Here the same. Three, two, two, one. That should be a little wider. This this would be one. That's too too, bar, too wide. Should be like this. Three, one, two, two, uh, one, three. Then uh, the thickness of the strokes in the second system with the three areas means the following. When the thickest stroke line or stroke or dot is used, 
I go over here, a maximum, there is a minimum, a maximum, maximum, minimum, maximum, etc. This is the thickest line compared to here, for example. The line is becoming thinner, and there it is the thinnest. Means that the microphone is the closest to the surface, the closest, which means here, where the line is the thickest. And the thinner the line, the further, further away the microphone is. So we have spoken about the three areas, which means close to the point of excitement. That is this, this, and this, when the stroke goes like here. But when the stroke at the same time becomes thinner, then it also means go away from the surface. Whereas here, I remain on the surface. And I go from medium distance to close, here. Medium distance to close, aha, uh -huh, but Mm -hmm. That's it. <coughs> but I'm a little away here. <coughs> because I see here there's an increase of thickness, which means here I'm the closest. Here I'm the second closest. So this movement for the microphone means the following. Make it a little more wide. I scratch here, and I do this. That's it. That's this movement. And now I'm uh, the closest and I have to do this. One, two, three, four, five. Ka, ki, ka, ka, ka. One, two, three, four, five. And then go a little away into this direction. And again, one, two, three, four, five. Yes. And then again very close and direct. Getting away and getting close. Now what does this produce? The closer I am, the more brilliant, the more direct the sound is in the speakers. The further I am away on the tantrum itself, the more echo I hear, reverberation of, of that sound. It goes away in space. It's very far, like in a large hall. And at the same time, it, it is somehow um, muted. When I go into this direction, the sound becomes softer. And at the same time, I lose high frequencies. I get indirect vibrations. It changes the, the color of the sound. So we have this triangle always in respect to one point of excitement, which affects the dynamics, the timbre, the echo, the reverberation of, of each sound. Then the filterer does the same. I said the more high the filter is open, the brighter the sound. If the filter is only open in this region and the lower this region this area is, the darker the sound. When it's completely open, I hear all the frequencies that, which are in the original vibration. So it affects also the dynamics, because the closer <coughs> the filter, the more the filter is closed, the, so, the, the softer the sound, sound becomes, because I lose energy. All characteristics of the sound, again, are affected by this man, who plays the filter? Rhythm, when he makes then he super, superimposes a rhythm on what has already produced by the other players. And at the same time, he makes bright dark, bright dark, bright dark. And when he opens it, the sound becomes louder. And when he closes it, the sound becomes softer at the same time. So all the characteristics of the sound are. Uh, musically articulated by this player. Now this is a very strange situation that three players are playing on the same sound, working on the same sound. And that there is an inner polyphony within each sound that is produced. Only if all three would do exactly the same rhythm 
and would do all the movements in concerning the dynamics in parallel, which means when he plays louder, he goes closer to the point of excitement and he opens the filter wider. This happens very rarely in the piece. Then all three would go in parallel. But most of the time, they do different things. They're, I compose them in a polyphonic movement. And that within uh, one sound, there is polyphony, superimposition of different rhythms and dynamic curves. This is something uh, that we haven't known before in, in the music. And I can't say myself what the sound would be without this interference of the three players. Because uh, then you don't, don't hear it. Now we have to ask, how do I describe these sounds which were unfamiliar to me when I heard them myself, amplified and filtered for the first time? I first tried to describe the actions. There was a score already worked out in which I described, take this plastic, uh, plastic box of, the f of, a, of a particular size. I would indicate the size of the plastic box and take it and, and uh, hold it against the surface of the tum-tum at a specific angle. And I try to describe the angle and then scratch it with a quick movement. So this score became something inc incredibly uh, complicated in describing the tools, and, and I felt it was absurd to write in 1964 a score and saying, take um, a plastic box that you use for cooking eggs <laughs> and uh, of the following size, and then hold it against the tam-tam of the of the firm Peister from Switzerland, and then, <laughs> then at, a, at an angle of 35 degrees, and then um, make a quick movement downwards for about 17 centimeters, etc. So I gave it all up. The description of the process in terms of measures and tools, I didn't even want to indicate any longer rubber or wood or glass or metal or whatever it was, or spoons or so. But then I thought, what shall I do? How can I obtain ever this sound world, at least approximately, in any future? And how can this piece uh, become a sort of a model uh, for similar processes? And what I did is the following. I made a scale. Which started the history of music all over again, so to speak, <laughs> and describes a little bit the language, the kind of language that we used, the technician and me, when we were speaking of, you know that, <coughs> or, or you know that, that one sound there, uh, which one, <coughs> and he would say, yes, yes, I, I remember. <coughs> See, that's all we could do in order to be more precise than saying like a dog or so, or like, because it was never exactly like, and it, it doesn't really matter. So what I made, I made a scale of 36 steps, steps from the darkest, uh, darkest and lowest sounds to the brightest and highest sounds, and I used words. For example, Wispern in German. I have tried this afternoon to find similar words in English that describe in an onomatopoetic language uh, the nature of the sound. Whisper or uh, zischen, we say. Zischen, like tss. When you, as I, I explained to the Englishman this afternoon uh, these words by describing actions, I said, what, how do you call it when you open a bottle of mineral water? And they said, ah, fizz. That's what I meant. So from the highest and brightest sounds to the darkest, 
from rumbling, hooting. Then I have indicated tromboning. They said that doesn't exist in English. I said, well, if you have trumpeting, why don't you have tromboning? <laughs> Uh, they said, well, okay, uh, they will understand. <laughs> they will understand. You see, I have left out now. I could have written all the lists here. And you can, that's why I put the question mark here, because I thought when they come in this, uh, this evening, they will read this, and then the question mark might tell them to invent the others which are lacking here, between uh, tromboning and rattling and baying and squeaking. Here you can fill in, let's say here 15 or 8 and here 8 and here 8 or 10, 10, 10, then you come <coughs> approximately to 36. And try to be as precise as possible in not uh, giving two or three words which might be mistaken for almost the same sound. For example, I have a sound which comes in that example, <coughs> schwirren. What's meant is this sound. And then they said, well, it's fluttering. I said, oh, think of, of, of the, the wings of a bird. He said, fluttering. I said, flutter, that is not like, you must like schwirren, schwirren in German. He said, no, it's fluttering in English. But the ah is, I said, it must be higher. Because I was looking for a vowel that indicate, indicates more precisely the, the schwirren. And then I said, no. In our language, it is the same like an arrow that's going through the air. We say schwirrend. And then they said, well, then you need whistling, but you must say it is an arrow, otherwise it is <laughs> Well, okay, then I said whistling, arrow. <laughs> that's what I meant. So we have two English words, whistling, fluttering, for that schwirrend that somewhere is, is here in, in my scale. Swishing, I hear. See, it's wonderful when, when you once try to bring order into these words and uh, do it once at home, it's very interesting, and make a scale with the words. Because once you have got that scale, then you have a, a scale which is certainly more precise than our traditional scale of, not scale, our traditional vocabulary for describing musical instruments, which simply describes the instrument. When I say uh, tuba or uh, flute or oboe, then I immediately identify an object with which the sound is produced with the sound. Whereas here we try to catch the sound directly because we don't know the object that might produce this, this sound. That is the whole problem now. For the first time, we try to find a language which describes the sound more directly rather than describing the, the instrument with which the sound is produced. And this kind of scale of four sounds is badly needed. There is a so-called Oswald catalogus, which is also not so old, which uh, gives a scale for all the colors that we can perceive. And since many, many years I'm trying to um, work out scales for sounds. And there are suggestions to do it in, with numbers, other suggestions to do it with words. Ultimately, it will be a mixture of a technical description uh, in terms of frequency bands, attacks and decays of a certain sound, together with words. Anyway, in microphony, all the structures that I have composed have a word or a group of words to indicate the sound that the musicians uh, have to look for. And then they take their, their bag and go into the shops, that's what they did then in Cologne, and look for tools that make uh, uh, whispering or fluttering sound. And then they come back, for example, with a plastic propeller that you use for uh, small ventilators on, on desks in offices. And they connect the plastic propeller uh, uh, electrically 
and then the propeller starts uh, turning, it, it has plastic wings, and then they hold it against the tum tum, and then it makes. And I say, that's pretty close. And then someone else says, well, wait, I will bring something else. And then we, we, we try if we can get even a more uh, characteristic uh, fluttering sound, <coughs> respectively whist whistling sound. That's the way it, we did it. For weeks then, we, we met uh, every day or every second day for several hours and brought a lot of material into the room where the tam-tam was and tried out what would be the best instruments. Though I had already made my experiments before, I could make suggestions. But in many cases, we found much better solutions by working all together. There are special shops in Cologne, for example, which produce nothing but rubber uh, different kinds of rubber tools, pipes, rubber pipes, uh, rubber blocks, etc. And we tried all the different rubber to tools to uh, scratch on the surface with the, with the rubber, with the different types of rubber, artificial rubber, natural rubber, etc. And for some sounds we were able to use it. Or we took brushes, let's say, different kind of brushes, and brushed the surface, then we get all these <laughs> these sounds. Or uh, paper that you use for uh, drawing in architectural offices. Uh, uh, yeah. When you uh, press it together, it makes it <laughs> that this, this kind of, of noise. But when you do this against the surface of the tam-tam, it produces still another sound, etc., etc. So let me uh, just point out what is in this section where several characteristics are concentrated that happens only once in the entire piece, that many uh, structures are collage, being brought together. That's why this page, page is particularly um, revealing. We have here a fluttering sound, loud, and then I have to do it twice with, with some tool. And here I remember we took a cardboard tube and cut it at a different size and uh, then scratch it over the surface of the tam tam. Then it makes that, that strange sound. And uh, if you want it in the medium range, that you, then you cut the cardboard at a particular length. If you want to have a higher sound, then you take a thinner cardboard tube and a small, shorter. When you want a low sound, then you take a rather big cardboard tube and a low one, then make ooh, ooh, no, no, still lower. Ooh, ooh. Well, that was high, very low. Then, then it comes to sounds which are uh, hooting, like ships. This kind of sound we make with big cardboard tubes or these emmers. No, no, no. How they are called? Not emmers. Mm. Where you have the washing powder in, oh, made of cardboard. Uh, bath, what? Buckets of, of cardboard. Do you have them in England? Drum. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then you scratch them over the tempter. That is a snoring. Then uh, here is a sound, which is, uh, what is it? Chirping. Chirpent in German, like the crickets do. This kind, but, but with a more precise pitch still. I can't, this trill with, with an E, E sound. This is here. Uh, how did we do that, actually? I can't remember. Uh, then whispering, sometimes we use even the voice and shout or whisper or speak into the tam-tam itself, very close to the surface. Then the tam-tam is excited by the vocal vibrations. Trumpeting, there I remember, we used again cardboard tubes. Uh, roaring, um, a box, a, a square box of cardboard, but of thick cardboard, and then with the edge of the thick bar cardboard, we scratch the surface. Then singing, but uh, I have said in the commentary to this score, singing 
uh, not vocally in this case. So what we actually used here, we made a monochord like the old Greek did when they did the first calculations about pitches. A monochord, a piece of wood, and then we took um, a piano string. Uh, we stretched it over two screws and then made it very tight. And then hold this string against the tam-tam and take a cello bow and bow the string. And then you get a singing sound, a very high singing sound. Uh, well, the shorter it is, the higher the sound. And the longer it is, when you make this, you get a glissando. While you're, while you're bowing. Or other sounds are done with glasses. Also, a very, when it is very high singing, we use a glass. Let's say a drinking glass, a wine glass. And hold it like this against the surface. And you know that effect that you also can produce when you wet your finger and make a circular movement on the edge of the wine glass, you get that high singing sound, ringing sound. And when you do the same thing on the surface of the tam-tam, then you must take a little chalk, otherwise there is not enough resistance on the tam-tam. So you make the tam-tam full of chalk and then you draw this glass on the surface and then you get this continuous high glass sound, singing sound. So there are certainly several interpretations for each word, and that's what I like. But it has always this, this characteristic quality in a relationship to another sound. What else is still indicated? No, singing high and low. I should say that with this score, which is fairly abstract, because it uses the words and leaves it up to the discretion of the performers, what kind of material they are going to use to correspond with the verbal instructions. In addition to this abstract score, I am also publishing a version, which means what we have done in order to realize this score. So there is that safety process, because I have learned throughout the years that it is better to give an example than leaving it completely in the air, because tapes, as you know, tapes get lost and, and they, they get ruined after a couple of years. And if I want that this work develops and can be used at any time when even the plastic material has disappeared and the spoons and God knows what kind of beings will be then on this earth. Uh, let's say in, in 500 years, it would be quite interesting to realize this microphony with what they think would be interesting for roaring. Most probably there won't know lions anymore. And, and uh, when I said serpent, God knows <coughs> that they still know crickets. <laughs> or, and what is snoring, perhaps they don't snore anymore. <laughs> but it, it would nevertheless be interesting. So I describe it will be quite funny seen from the future to discover this score, or to, to use this score in 500 years, as I said, how we did it. Then I make photographs of all the tools that we have used. And it really looks like a table full of garbage. <laughs> it's unbelievable, these old cardboard things and, and these uh, uh, rubber things, most of them are a little destroyed through the process of having played with them many times. The glasses are half broken, they are bottles wine bottles and all sorts of things. It looks very strange. And uh, I photograph each instrument that has been used for a particular section. I number the photograph and I number the word and then there's a whole list of photographs at the beginning of the score. And uh, then I indicate uh, how this instrument was used with words. I describe it, make a script. I should say a few words about the structuring of the form of the piece. There's a formal scheme, a form scheme, as I say, which is completely abstract what concerns the connection rules. What are connection rules? I have composed 33 independent musical moments. Each musical moment has a typical, um, and a, t a typical rhythm, a typical um, timbre, 
indicated by words. It has a typical inner texture, a typical direction. It goes, let's say, from slow to fast or from high to low. And these 33 musical moments are distributed among the two groups of players according to the instructions of the form scheme. And the instructions are as follows. I have used three types of signs. Plus sign <coughs> means support what the other group is doing. Minus sign means destroy what the other group is doing. And then this sign means be neutral. Neither destroy nor support what the other group is doing. Now, there are two groups on the tam, -tam. <coughs> The tam, tam I'm playing here. And I'm playing now a group. Then the other group is starting. If I play now a musical moment, which is fairly quiet, then I will not disturb what the others are doing. When I choose a, mus uh, a musical moment, one of the 33, which is very active, that I even have to do like this. Then you will see the tam-tam starts doing, making these movements, and I am disturbing the others, what they are doing. He is, for, for example, just doing this very softly <laughs> with a glass, and then all of a sudden, the thing comes from the other side. So he, can, he destroys my action, and this destruction creates new sounds, which are very interesting. So he is following... <laughs> You mean the protest also? <laughs> he says, <"Yeah>, hey! <laughs> yes, that too. So I can, I can be neutral. I can support what the other is doing. To support now in an acoustical sense, not in a physical sense, which means I hear, I know they are doing something very soft, very high. Then I can support the others in so far as I do, I'm doing something also not too loud and very low, so that they are very clearly stick out. Then I support their activity, etc. So this is not done, this decision is not made during the performance, but the decision is made before the performance. The musicians sit together, look at the different movements, and then they have a form of a form of scheme, which is like this. Etc. 36. That's, yeah. If you would take a microphone, then this sound... <laughs> very interesting. Well, you can do it. <laughs> You can imagine when you amplify it, this is it's like an enormous animal flying through this hole. Etc. So, uh, there it's all, <coughs> all the colors are in it, all the pitches are in it, all the dynamics are in it. Just the way I use it. So let's assume this, this is the form scheme and it has 36 of these boxes. And then, destroy, support, and be neutral, have a second um, indication also with these signs, which say with something that is similar, what the others do, something that is opposed to what the others do, and something, no, opposed is, I think, this sign, similar, opposed, and something, no, these two. Is, is you here? Do you, do you remember the other one? Is you Davis here? Different. Different. Yeah, what kind of sign do I have? Aha, this one, I think. That's it. So when I make a version now, and this, these three signs occur, then when, when I have this together with a plus sign, then it says, 
look for something similar to what the others are doing and support. But it can also, with something similar, destroy. Or with something similar, be neutral. Or I can take something that is different from what the others are doing. And support them with something different, destroy them with something that is different, or be neutral with something that is different from what the others are doing. Or I can take something that is opposite of what the others are doing. And again, support with something that is opposite, support with something, uh, destroy with something that is opposite, and be neutral with something that is opposite. So in each connection, there are several signs which indicate how the choice of a particular musical moment is um, or must be made according to the connection rules. The connection rules are indicated by abstract symbols. So the musicians sit together and say, well, I have now to get something similar uh, in relationship to what you have just done, bef started before, and it is supposed to destroy you. Let's look through all these moments, which moment gives me the, the chance to do this best. And when they make a version for the performance, the very last moment is chosen first. Then, in respect to the very last, the very first of the piece uh, reacts to the very last one with the transformation sign, with the, re with the signs of um, relationship. And then the second reacts to the first, the third to the second, the fourth to the third, etc. Then there are a few moments in the whole piece which are fixed in their position and always come in the same position. There is a very important one which is the so-called tutti 157, which is always at a certain point in the, in the fall. Another one is here, which is a so-called tutti pianissimo. Everybody plays very softly. And here is another one, which is, uh, excuse me, tutti pianissimo. Then they, they play all synchronous. And here's another one, which is tutti forte. These two also can be interchanged in position, but the position is fixed once and forever. Tutti forte and tutti pianissimo can only be in these two positions. And the tutti 157, where all the elements come together from the entire composition in a fixed uh, superimposition position that I have determined, this position is fixed forever. This cannot change. So all the movements which are in between can change their order from version to version. Now I play microphony one, the recording, and then I would like to answer questions if you have questions about what I have said and what you have heard. Microphony one, in German the title is Mikrophony and. Because there is a microphony two for 12 singers. And the process is the same. The singers sing into microphones, or similar, let's say, and what they sing is electronically transformed. And then play back over speakers. There is a feedback in microphony two between a Hammond organ, an ele electric organ, and the electric output of this electric organ is fed into electronic modulators, and the sounds of the electric organ modulate the singers, and vice versa. There's an intermodulation between the electric organ and the singers. The process to listen to a tam-tam, which as an instrument is something that is over 3,000 years old. I mean, not that particular one, but the principle, this tam-tam. It's written like this. Tam-tam. To listen to such an instrument like a doctor would listen 
The medical doctor would listen with the stethoscope to the body of a person. <coughs> That's what we are actually doing. This process now has many uh, outlooks for the future. Quite a few composers have used similar processes, I mean, being applied to people, actors, singers, instrumentalists. The microphone has become now a musical instrument since Microphony won. And uh, once someone said, must it be a tam-tam? I said, no, I can imagine that you take an old Volkswagen and examine it musically and use the score and then you go inside into that old thing and bang it and scratch it and do all sorts of things and play microphony using the microphone or anything. Discover the micro world of the acoustic vibrations, amplify it and transform it electronically with our electronic means. That's why I call it electronic live music as opposed to electronic music which is produced in a studio. Everything that happens, happens in the actual time of the performance. There's no preparation like in electronic music which is on tape.